Uh, well, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, my first time in Singapore. And uh, I look forward to the following days discovering this lovely country and a lovely city. And uh, so I'm, I think uh, the group, the Java user group, is quite recent, isn't it? You have had a couple of meetups this year, if I'm not mistaken. It's been like one year. And, uh, yeah, we had five, six. Five to six meetups, yeah. So I'm, I'm quite happy to see so many people interested in sharing the knowledge. And uh, so as you saw on the, uh, the meetup page, well, we have uh, two presentations today. And uh, you guys let me know how fast or how slow I should go. Because these topics, uh, well, I get very excited uh, with, with the topics that I'm going to show. And uh, when I get excited, I tend to speak very, very fast. And uh, so please let me know. Raise your hand if I should slow down. By the way, English is not my native language. It's actually Spanish. So if I sense something that you don't understand, please also let me know. And uh, if you want to have a break in between, also let me know. If you have any questions, ask me immediately. Don't wait until the end, and I will try my best to answer them. Are we cool? Excellent. So here we go. Uh, the topic for the first one, it says, is Java libraries you can't afford to miss. Now, the idea of this talk is to showcase a series of projects that, or actually open source projects, that you can make use on your daily work in order to make it easier, faster, but more important, funnier, a much better experience for you to do work. So for that, I have this particular use case. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you work on the server side of mobile, right? Am I, am I right? Does anybody here actually still work with desktop applications what is Java fix or swing? No? Yeah, one guy. Yay! Excellent. So what I have today is an example wrap around a desktop application just because I'm a desktop guy. I love the desktop. But the projects that we'll see can be put into use in any kind of environment, whether it be web or mobile or something else. So because most of us have worked or still have to work with REST APIs, this is the example I'm going to show which is how can we consume a REST API? It doesn't matter how the API is written. It can be done in many different ways. Who here still uses or is a fan of Spring Boot? It's probably the winning framework right now. Well, that's one option, but there are many others, of course. But we're going to consume this API, and uh, we want these components to be reusable. We want them to be a small, flexible, reusable, but also testable. And most important of all, we don't want to repeat ourselves and we want to remove all that boilerplate code. Because if we are working with Pojo based uh, frameworks, and you know the conventions of creating a job in, right? With gators and setters and whatnot, and then you can see that your code starts to grow. And this is just one of the few things that, if we can, we should avoid. So the libraries we're going to see today is likely that you are familiar with some of them, are these ones. So on one side, have the production libraries, and the other side, we have the testing libraries. And uh, here's these two other alternatives. You may use one or the other. There's actually a way that you can use both of them together. I haven't seen this too much in production, but now it is possible. In the case of reactive programming, um, you can pick one, depending if you are a Spring fan, you go with this one, or you just go with the previous one. In terms of logging frameworks, this is more popular, but this one is more recent, and they almost pretty much have the same features. So it's up to you to decide where do you want to go. So first, disclaimer. All the projects that we're going to see are open source, which means you can put them to work immediately. And uh, there is no string attached. Uh, most of the projects are either Apache or BSD, so feel free to use them uh, as you want. My goal for today is that by the end of the session, you feel like this. Let's see if we can achieve this goal, all right? OK, so my name is Andres Almeray. I'm originally from Mexico. That's why I say my native language is Spanish. But I work for this company, the Swiss company called Canoe. We are kind of a small-ish, medium-ish company where uh, we do all the stuff that we want with Java. Our customers range from financial, for uh, automotive, 
from, I think we may have one of the pharmaceuticals because, hey, we're in Basel, Switzerland, where the big pharmaceuticals are. So we do all the great things with Java. Well, we also into alternative uh, JVM languages. I am very much into Groovy. Uh, have you heard about Groovy before? Anybody here actually makes use of Groovy in production besides Gradle? Yeah, a few hands. Well, Gradle is a great build tool, and I wish I had more time to tell you all the goodness about this. We'll see what I can show you today. And uh, I'm a Java champion, as you can tell by that logo and this nice t-shirt, uh, which means uh, I kind of like to speak about Java and promote Java-based technologies, and uh, that's what I'm here. I'm also a uh, founder of the Hacker Garden Group. What is a Hacker Garden? It's kind of like a hackathon, but we're always working in open source projects and we don't throw away the code. The goal of the, the meeting is to meet new friends, uh, learn new ID shortcuts perhaps, but most importantly, contribute back to an open source project of your choosing. So we always push back the code into a particular project. So whether it be a, a GitHub, pull request, or something else, and uh, that's it. We, might, we have fun with pizza, beer, and many other things. So it's a really nice way to get into open source and contribute back to community. So again, let me remind you, the use case is this one. Let me show you the application as it works. And uh, I was changing to perhaps the GitHub, the third version. Uh, Michael, I might need the uh, access to the network. So the whole project, whoa, this one didn't work. Okay, let's try the other version. That's what I came preparing to have different versions. And uh, here we go. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. There we are. Right. So this particular application is going to connect to the uh, GitHub uh, REST API and will query for all the repositories of a particular organization. So if I enter, did you notice how the uh, load button started to uh, was, became enabled and now it's disabled? That's the nice things that we can do with JavaFX quite easily. Uh, so if I enter a valid organization, this will query the network and start to populate the list here down with all the information. And there is also this number here. That will become important in a moment and we don't have network. Uh, so that's another thing that can happen. Don't worry, I was prepared for this. Let's do it again. Uh, there is hotspot. And let's try it again. It's loading. And loads repositories per page, and if you can see very slightly, all the repositories were sorted by name. This is quite important. All right, so that's basically what we want to build, and it's going to be built in different ways. So we're going to use the GitHub API for one reason, because it's very popular, and uh, chances are that if you are contributed to open source projects before, you have encountered GitHub in one way or another. The uh, definition of the whole API, you can find it in that particular link. And uh, it will describe all the different operations that you can use. For now, what we're going to center only is, ju again, just querying repositories. How you query repositories is defining that particular URL. It tells you all the different options, what is the initial payload of the input for that particular URL, and what will be the output on the, in the expected format. Basically, what you need to do is issue a call, a get call, matching that particular URL pattern. This will be the name of the organization. In the example that I just showed, this will be the value of Griffin. And this will return me a JSON payload with lots of information. The payload looks like this. It's a JSON list, JSON array, with JSON objects, with different properties. Actually, the repositories have like 40 or 50 different properties. For now, I'm only interested in these particular ones. And as you know, as Java developers, we like to follow certain naming conventions. And when we have to use different words for a particular identifier, what convention do we use? We follow camel case. But in the JSON world, or in the JavaScript world, they prefer to use snake case, like this. There will be a mapping somehow from these properties to the other, and we will see a project that will do that. So in order to build this application that I just showed, uh, we're going to need dependency injection, I will say that in this time of, of our development time in 2017, building an application, even a simple one like that you saw, without 
any use of dependency injection is a little bit of a waste of time. You can gain more if you start already in your design thinking in terms of dependency injection. Uh, we definitely need an HTTP client and somehow map REST behavior on top of that. Uh, we need to handle JSON mapping from JSON objects into Java. We would like a way to remove all the boilerplate code that we need to write. And of course, we need to handle concurrency because of one interesting point. Uh, for those of you that used to build desktop applications, you know that there is a one rule that we should not break, and that is everything that is UI related, such as painting, accessing properties, or writing to properties, must happen inside the UI thread. In Swing, this is called the event dispatch thread. And everything that is not UI related should not be in the UI thread, should be in any other thread, whether the main thread or a background thread, it doesn't matter. So, querying the network, issuing a call to GitHub, and grabbing all the repositories should happen in a background thread. But once we have the results, we have to display them inside the UI thread because we are changing the UI. So we now have at least two different threads working and we have to, have to handle concurrency in some way. You can get the code for the S application and the other variants at that particular URL. Everything that you see is open source as well. I uh, think that the license that I use for this code is uh, GPL3, and, uh, but still it works. And, as, and it's written in different ways with different uh, libraries. Uh, because as remember I showed you, you could use Juice for dependency injection and Spring on some others, so you will see the different variations. How are we doing? So far so good? All right, so let's get into dependency injection. I guess most of you are familiar with dependency injection. Basically, what we want to do is define behavior or contracts. What I would recommend you, if you're not doing this already, I would recommend you to define your contracts using interfaces. This makes it very easy to change into implementations. We like to say, like, just like application service, that it will be very trivial to migrate an application from one server to the other in terms of independence injection. Kind of trivial to move one implementation of a contract like this to another one because it's just a matter of implementing the interface in a different way. Well, uh, it turns out that in this case it actually is. And what you want to do is not exactly change implementations for production, but mostly do it for testing. Because this is in, in testing is when you really want to tweak the behavior of one of the collaborator classes. So once you define your contract in any way you want to, in this case, uh, we're going to use, uh, we're going to define a repositories method, takes an argument and returns a collection of repository objects. We'll see in a moment what that is. And uh, we can consume this using JSR330 annotations. JSR330 is the JSR that defines how we do dependency injection. So basically it's add inject on the thing that we want and then we can use these things directly. I'm aware that there are three ways to do dependency injection in Java. The one that I prefer is to use fill injection because the, your dependency framework mechanism will still use reflection. It, it doesn't matter how, how you set it up unless you use one mechanism, uh, no, one framework which is called um, Dagger from Google. This one requires compile time dependency injection. This doesn't require um, reflection, but it's not widely used, especially not on the server side. So you will use some reflection, so I prefer to use this way. The other is to use constructor injection. The advantages of constructor injection is that you can set these fields as final, but if you, had, you start to have a lot of collaborators, more than four or five, your constructor will get bigger and the setup will be much more cumbersome, especially in testing. So if you have a, const a, a class like this that, that has dependencies, uh, more than four or five, Construction injection might not be a good idea. You may want to go back to perhaps fill injection. And the last option is to use setters, which is the most flexible one because you can set the value at any time you want to. But again, now you are dealing with mutable dependencies. So some people don't like this idea because they, they prefer to have a stable dependencies to have them immutable. Okay, but it's up to you to decide, especially with your team, which one of three options is best for you. So for this, for doing dependency injection, I will showcase Juice for the sole reason that Juice is the 
reference implementation of JSR 330. It's very easy to get started with Juice. What you do is you create a module, it's an object, it's a type, that defines how you're going to map from certain type, which is called the source, to another type, which is called the target, which is exactly what we're seeing here. There's a module, and we're mapping the source type, this is an interface, to a target type, a concrete class, in a specific scope, for example, singleton. So the dependency injection container will assert there's only one instance of this thing managed by the container. Here we got both the source and the target type defined the same, and we're also using a singleton scope. You could use prototype scope, or if you're using a web application, it may be session scope or application scope. And here we have something that is called like a lazy initialization. Here's the source type, it's GitHub API, but we're, f we're binding this to a provider. You can think of a provider in a sprint terms, the same thing as a factory bin. And there are two other types of bindings we're not really used to much, but just you know that everything that you do with Juice has to be done programmatically. The advantages again are, because it's the reference implementation of JSR 330, is the easiest to get started. You can bind any kind of types, you can bind instances, and you can also bind constant values. Those are the two other types of bindings that I didn't show previously. And you can provide lazy evaluated instances using providers. It is extensible because the um, one thing, if I, sure, well, this thing is broken now. One thing that I didn't show in the code is, uh, let's, actually, let's show the code. Um, let's edit this. So it should be faster instead of opening IDE. Let's look in the code. Um, where do I need to show? Uh, the lifecycle, yes. So we go into the controller. Yeah, we got the injections. Uh, we got the view. Where is this post construct method? Uh, it's not there. No sound, thank you. Uh, it's not in the model, so where is it? It's here on the GitHub Impulse MPI. No, sorry. Oh, I see, I know. I know where this thing is. Is in the handler. I believe so. Yes. These annotations right here. Boss construct and pre-destroy. You probably say, have seen this. Bigger? Of course. Boss construct and pre-destroy. These annotations are very common in other environments such as CDI or web applications. Well, Juice is not aware of these annotations. So if you use plain Juice as it is, no magic will happen. You need a special extension for this to happen. And luckily, Juice is extensible. So this thing will work. In case that you're wondering about this extension, we can see here in the build file, the dependencies for this project, the somewhere here is juice, right there. And the extension you need is this one. This will give you access to the post-construct and pre-destroy uh, hook points. OK. <laughs> So as a bonus, if you make use of Juice, you get Guava as a transitive dependency. Guava is also a very common library that was created back in, uh, I think, in before JDK 6 came out. So it's quite mature. It has a lot of information. And it gives you access to new collections. If you ever had the need to, uh, in a map, to know, given a value, which key is related to it, use a by map. If you ever had the need to have multiple values associated with a single key, we neutrally use uh, internally a list and we know how to handle this, this idiom. Well, the multi-map does this for you already. Or if you want to have two keys associated uh, to a value as if it were something like a relational table, then you use a new collection called table. And a few other things. It gives you uh, utility classes for handling additional collections and concurrency and test and I.O. And uh, it also gives you some functional capabilities. Who is using JDK 8 already? Okay, half of you. 
For those of you that are still stuck somehow in JDK 6 or JDK 7, and you want to be able to write code in a functional way, then Guava is your friend. Once you learn how to do things with optional and predicate and function, then migrate to Java 8 is pretty much a no-brainer. There are a few changes in the API, especially optional in Guava, is different from the optional in JDK 8. Some methods names are different, and a few things in behavior are different, but for most of it, it's pretty much the same. If you are not a fan of Juice, then you probably have encountered Spring before. And Spring is a huge portfolio of projects. And right now, I want to talk only about Spring Core, the initial project that created everything. A Spring Core is more than just a dependency injection container. It can give you access to uh, JDBC, to creating clients with JMX or even servers with JMX. Anybody here had to work with JMX? All right. Well, if you have to do it later, trust me, clients and servers in JM, uh, JMX servers with the Spring is just a couple of lines. It's so easy, should not be allowed. Uh, Another thing that I don't know if you guys know, but the message format, the default implementations in the JDK are not thread safe. For example, simple date format, not thread safe. Also, don't use Java util date. We got Java time since Java 8. So for those of you that are lucky to use Java 8, switch already to Java time. Forget about Java util date. It does not exist. Uh, so message format and simple date format are not thread safe. That's a bummer. But there are implementations of the message format interface coming from the Spring Core that give you that thread safety capabilities. So give it a try. And uh, so that's basically what I want to say about Spring. I must confess, I'm a Spring fanboy, but I tend to use Juice a lot because Juice is a smaller in size and it only does one thing, dependency injection, nothing more. So reducing boilerplate code. And uh, we're going to get into interesting waters now because the next project, some people love it and the other half hate it. There's no one sitting in between. So we talked about Java Beans conventions. And I know that you can tell your IDE to generate source code. Like uh, you get a, a class, they find some, I don't know, five fields, and then you say generate getters and setters and equals and hash code, and that's it. Boom, you get your class generated. You know the problem with this is that this is not your code. This is machine-generated code. But you are now responsible for handling that code. Because if you need to rename something, yeah, I can tell the ID, rename property, good. And if I need to add new property, yes, add a property, add the getters and setters, a couple of clicks, we're done. What happens if you need to remove a property? You do it by hand. There is no easy way to do this, right? OK, so that's why you guys are now in charge. You have to maintain something that the machine created. Would it be better, in terms of the Java Beans convention, that the compiler we are aware of that convention? If we specify somehow with certain hints, I want this to be a property, then generate all the appropriate code. And if I, if anybody here familiar with the builder pattern, when we create a new class uh, that, that is mutable in order to create an immutable instance, so the, the builder pattern has perhaps used the uh, fluent interface design for the methods used to uh, construct the instance. So creating the builder is actually a lot of code. Would it be better, given that this is a convention, to also let the compiler build the whole thing? Right? So for that, we use Lombok. Love it or hate it. Now Lombok hooks into the compiler and allows the compiler to be aware of additional conventions. So what we're doing here with the add data annotation, we're telling the compiler that for all the fields that we have here, we should have a companion setter and getter. If it's not final, there will be a setter. If it's final, it will only uh, provide the getter. And it will also generate an appropriate constructor taking all the arguments in the order that we define them. It will also generate an equals and hash code implementation that uses all of these things. And it will generate a two-string implementation as well. And uh, the add setter annotation, I'm using it here because I'm placing a new annotation on the generated method. What is that annotation? JSON property. This is for another project called Jackson. 
There are a few uh, JSON parsing libraries in Java, and by a few I mean a lot. There are more like 30. But Jackson is perhaps the fastest one. And Jackson allows me to do mapping very easily, but I have to do the mappings on the setter methods. So with this funky annotation here, we're telling on the generate method by Elon Buck, place this annotation. I remember what I said something about this camel case and snake case convention. So the incoming payload has a snake case, but Jackson will find that property and map it to my camel case convention. And we're doing the same thing for HTML URL. Any other property that is found in the mapping, remember that I said that the repository payload has like 40 properties or more? If you add this on the, on the class, then all those properties are going to be ignored. So now you are free to evolve your API. If you want to handle just a subset of properties, do this. If you evolve your API and add more properties, even if you had a one-to-one -one mapping, then your code will not be broken, but it will not be able to handle the new properties until you actually write new code. That kind of makes sense. And uh, we also make use of the builder annotation in just a moment. Now, be aware of the usage of the data annotation with collections in your fields, especially if you're working with JPA, because it's very easy to create uh, JPA entities using Lombok. But if you have reference to another entity, what is going to be the, uh, the default implementation of ECOS and HashCode? By the way, it's going to follow the, the conventions laid out by the effective Java written by Josh Block. So we know that the equals and Haskell implementation will be sound, except when you have references, especially in JPA. Because if you have bidirectional dependencies, without, sorry, bidirectional references within the two entities, the equals and Haskell of A depends on B, which depends on A, which depends on E, infinite loop, stack flow, overflow. The same thing happens with a string. So if you use Lombok and JPA, and you have reference, and you have collections, you have to write equals and hash code and to a string by hand. It's not a problem because at data, get it and set it, if it sees that you already provided that particular method, if you have a custom equals and hash code, it will use it and it will not generate anything by itself. So it will use your code and you should be fine. Here's an, how we can make use of the builder. A static method. This name could be anything you want to. Provide all the arguments that you want, and then internally, this object is the mutable, the immutable one. In this case, I made it mutable because that's what Jackson requires. But in this way, you could create a builder. And now, how do you make use of this? There will be a new builder class associated with repository. You call build on it, and all these met those properties will have a with name or with full name that will return uh, the same builder object. And at the end, you simply call dot .build on it, and boom, you get a repository object. If you want to use JSR 305, this is additional annotations, for example, non-null and nullable. If you put them here, say, for example, non-null string name, that means that when you invoke the builder, you have to call the method with name at least once. If you do not, and you try to build this thing, it will tell you by using a runtime exception a, I'm missing a name because you put right there that it should be non-null. Actually, Lombok understands the non-null annotation from IntelliJ IDEA, and it also has another annotation called not null. We actually have like different five, five different annotations that do the same thing for different projects. Lombok understands all of them to do exactly the same thing. Here's another thing that we can do. Say you have a base class called application event and uh, another class called new instance event. And this one can extend from anything you want to, and you can apply a data on it. So it's not a problem with hierarchies. And because this is a subclass, I'm telling uh, add data to customize the equals and hash code. If I do this, then the generated code will check for the equals and hash code of the superclass, which right now is silly because it doesn't do anything, but it's an example. And it will also call the two string of my superclass here in the generated one. Because this is a final field and it has annotated with non-null, the constructor will check that you have passed a value to, to this uh, property. 
and if all you generate the getter, there will be no setter. Once the constructor is invoked and you pass a null null, it will throw a null pointer exception with a message saying, I was expecting a value for the property instance, it will give you the name, but it was null. So it's better that you simply say null pointer exception on line 41 or something. So it's quite good. Now, Lombok allows you to, again, reduce the boilerplate code by generated bytecode instead of generated source code. So if you need to change something, if you need to have new getters and setters, what do you do? You go back to your Pojo, add a new property, perhaps customize some uh, with additional annotations, and recompile, and boom, you get all the code already. And then you may be thinking, what about the IDE? If this works at compile time, I need to work at source time. My consumers must be aware of the different methods that are going to be created, isn't it? Well, if you're using NetBeans, uh, Lombok understands, uh, NetBeans understands all the additions by Lombok by the default. If you're using IntelliJ, there's an additional plugin, very easy to install, that will give IntelliJ all the hints about the different methods that are going to be added. And if you're using Eclipse, uh, Lombok is a little bit more difficult to configure just because it, uh, Lombok requires the APT tool, the annotation processor tool, which is a pain to configure in Eclipse. But Lombok comes in with a very trivial UI that allows you to configure Lombok very easily. Just double click on it, set it up, point it to your ID, you're done in business. Nothing has to be done. Uh, so don't forget to enable annotation processor in your project, in your ID. Again, in NetBeans, there's nothing to do. In IntelliJ, is one check per project. And in Eclipse, you have to do it explicitly. If you give a try to Lombok, I will recommend you to use only add data, getter, setter, and builder. There are a few other annotations right there uh, provided by Lombok, but they fall into either the experimental case or the really scary case. Because what Lombok does is rewrites the biker. Now, don't be afraid, still safe to use. We use it with our customers. We, and our customers, half of them are banks, and they are fine with this. And it works, and there's no data and no money lost. So it works. How are we doing so far? OK? Questions? No? Good. You gave me, you let me know. OK, now let's turn into behavior. And while we are working with an application, we'd like to know what things are happening. How, how is the data flowing from one place to another? What is the first thing that we do as developers to figure out what's going on with our application? System dot out print line, right? Uh, yes, fine. But it would be better if we could be able to be to have this information in a more persistent way, right? For example, a log. So we can use different logging frameworks. I'm going to put it right now out there. There is no good logging framework in Java. None. There are many out of there. None of them are good. But for all of them. The least worst is this one, SLA4J. Because SLA4J has two features that I really like. One is that it doesn't matter if you're using Java Commons login, uh, sorry, Java UTS login, or Apache Commons login, or Log4J, which is version one, or Logback, or a few others. All of these different frameworks can be, or, or the calls of these def different frameworks can be routed to a single endpoint, and this is the SLA4J. Why would you like to do that? Or why would you do this? Because when you have a big project and you're consuming different dependencies, chances are that none of these dependencies are agreed upon on which logging framework to use. So you may have a, a collection of all different ones, right? But you want to centralize in just one place how to configure logging. So this is exactly what SLF4J allows you to do. It puts everything in one basket. So now you only need to configure logging in one place. The next thing that we do in logging is uh, when we do a login statement, for example, log.info, and we pass a string. If it's a plain string, nothing is wrong. If we construct a string based on appends on a few other objects, it may be a little bit expensive to create the final message. And once this is done, it gets passed to the, to the login method, in this case, info. And guess what? If the info level is not enabled, what happens with that object that we just created? Goes away, discarded. Well, we lost cycles 
creating this thing. So that's why we as developers, what do we do? We guard our login statements. We do, if log level, such level info is enabled, then we do log info, right? But our code starts to look a lot, lot uglier because if here and if there and whatnot. But if we use a variable arguments method, then you invoke the method log info, then give it a string that can work like a, like a formatted message. Like you remember the old days, printf and scanf from C. And as additional elements, the actual values that are going to be set on the final message. So internally, this method will do the check for you. Check if the level that you're invoking is enabled. If it is, constructs the message and send it. That is much better. So both SLF4J and Log4J2 have these features. Okay, next one. Let's do HTTP. There are many ways to do HTTP with Java. Actually, Java comes in with a very basic HTTP client. It's called URL Connection. But uh, it's very low level. So there are other projects out there that allows you to create HTTP clients. Most likely, you have encountered Apache HTTP clients from the HTTP components, which is, I would say, kind of OK. But how many of you have had the need already to consume services provided by the HTTP2? Not yet, but you will. And the moment that you do, let me tell you that on none of the options that you probably have seen so far support HTTP2, except this guy. This project called OK HTTP. It's a very basic HTTP client, a small memory footprint because it also works on Android and is HTTP2 ready since like two years ago. Here's how you do it. You create a client, then define, uh, you can, this method, this is just a single method. You create a request, and you can pass as many headers as you want. In this case, I'm not setting any headers. Uh, define the URL, what's the body of that object. You build this thing, here's my request. Send it to the client. You get a response back. On the response, you can query for the headers, for the status measures, the status code, everything that, that gives access to what is the underlying HTTP mechanism. And if everything is fine, Look what this thing is doing. Response.body. Here it grabs the body. Dot string. Now, the body that we're receiving or that we're expecting is uh, JSON, isn't it? We need somehow a way to map JSON content into Java objects. And that's what is going to come next. The advantages, again, of HTTP is that it's HTTP2 client ready. The behavior and the configuration extensive will be at factories. This is going to see in just a moment. And you can intercept the life cycle of HTTP. So if you want to listen or spoof for tokens or authentication or something else, register an interceptor on your client is very easy. Not that I was suggested to do bad things with uh, those headers, but anyway. Uh, now, OK, we can do HTTP, no problem. But we are Java developers. Do we need to work really with just JSON and JavaScript and low-level things? No, we want to work with Java objects. Would it be a way to map automatically JSON to Java and vice versa? So that when we say, I want to have a list of objects, Java objects, I just get the objects instead of doing the mapping myself? How many ways are there to implement REST? REST is very easy. Get, post, delete, head. There's no a different behavior how we do get, post, delete, head, and put, right? So for that, I'll suggest to have a look at this project called Retrofit. Now, Retrofit is quite cool. As a developer, what you need to do is the following. We define the contract of our API. If you look back into the, uh, if you were to look into the link that I provided earlier, there are two ways that we can query for the repositories. We start by setting the name of the repository. And this will give me a set of results. But if the results are paginated, then in the headers, I will get additional links and instruction on how to follow those links. So if, when you saw the application running, we had like 200, 245 repositories, and the number advanced by increments of 30, is because GitHub paginates element by 30. I could change that, of course. So what was happening is that for the first page, 
this method was invoked, and for the next pages, once the header were inspected, if there was a link, it will follow using this other method. Regardless of that, what is the return value? A list of repository objects wrap around in an object of type call. This is from rep uh, retrofit. What call will give me access is to the response. So I can query if it's successful or not. I can also query this thing for its headers to figure out if I had to follow a new link or not. All right, so it's just a simple interface. What's the next step? Create the actual HTTP client, like this. There's a builder. I can set up some basic configuration. For example, what is the URL I want to use, the standard URL from GitHub? Uh, here's a factory, the Jackson Converter factory. So now the uh, retrofit client will be able to do the conversion for me using Jackson. And then, so I build that object. And then notice this object, the builder, create given the, the interface that we defined it before. The, re the return for this is actually a Java Lang Reflect proxy that uses this API, but internally uses the HTTP builder created here. So in the end, as a developer, the only thing that you need to do as a consumer of the API is this, this is the object, call the method. This just looks like a Java method, isn't it? Like any other Java object that you do. And what would be the response of this? It will be a list of repositories already mapped from JSON. There's nothing else that you need to do. It's as simple as this. Uh, another advantage of using Retrofit is that it relies on HTTP already. So it's a small in-memory footprint. It's quite easy to get it started. The APIs of both Retrofit and OKHTTP are quite simple, similar. They follow the building pattern. So if you know how to use one, you will be very quite easy. You're going to find how to use the second API. How are we doing? OK? Because that was part of the magic. Good. Next one, multi-threaded code. How do we deal with doing the right thing in a desktop application? Eh. Remember, everything that is UI happens in one thread. Everything that is not happens in a different thread. Hmm. Uh, that means that we have to issue the network call in a different thread, handle it, and then push back all the results into a different thread. Is there something else, is there something in the past that you have seen that works like this? The guys that did Swing Development, JDK 6, Swing Worker, it allows us to issue a task to run it in a background thread and then come back at any time, right? But in the JavaScript world, we have something else. It's called promises. Wouldn't it be cool if we had promises in Java? OK, for those of you that say Java 8, you have something that looks like a promise, but it's kind of broken. And I will tell you why. This class is called completable future. It's broken because it's both a promise that is supposed to be fully async, non-blocking. And it's also a future, which is blocking. So what is it? Is it a, fruit, a future or is it a promise? If it's non-blocking it or it's blocking, it's both, and it shouldn't. So if you use it as a future, fine. If you use it as a promise, fine. But if there is a, another piece of your code that takes a completable future and then use it as a future because it extends from future, then it becomes blocking, and that's a problem. So just be aware of the different usages of completable future. And because some of you also said we are not able to use JDK 8 for now, no worries. You can use JDFL, which is a project that runs in JDK 6, and it also runs on Android. And it gives you that behavior, promises. So what a promise is is basically the idea of scheduling a task in the background, and then you register callbacks on that. When this thing is done, I will do this. If this thing fails, I will do that. When this thing finishes, regardless of it's correctly or fails, then I will do something else, right? This is the idea inspired by jQuery promises. So what we want to do now, what we're going to do now is modify our API to take a promise. And this first generic value is the return type that we expect. It will be a collection of repository objects, the POJO that we saw before. Now, at any point in time during the execution of the background test, there may be errors. And we want to notify these errors. Errors could be exceptions or troubles. That will be this type. 
But JDefer allows you to throw any kind of object. It could be a string, it could be another collection, it could be anything that is uh, that the application requires. And the last thing, remember what I said something about Swing Worker? Swing Worker, while you were working in the background, it will allow you to push intermediate results back to the UI. So this will be like a, like a progress. Well, that is the third element. If you need to notify the consumer, the, the, pers or the, the component that registers callbacks of intermediate results, how the, the progress of the task is, then you can use that. OK? So let me show you how you schedule the background task and then how you're going to consume it. For this, again, using the uh, dependency injection, we know this. Now there is a new type here coming from JDFR. It's a defer manager. This is the component that allows you to bootstrap or to issue tasks in any kind of executor. You can actually define which executor service you need to use for the deferred manager. Right. So now we're going to create a promise. So defer manager when and look at that, a lambda expression. But you can also use uh, anonymous classes if you want in JDK 6 and JDK 7. So this is actually the task that we need to invoke. Let's see at that. API, what is that? It's our retrofit enabled client, remember? And we're calling it just like a regular Java call. So we call this execute and we get what? A response of objects. Perfect. Now what do we do? We ask if the response is successful. If it is, just restore the body. And by doing this, the mapping from JSON to Java will happen. And what do we get? A collection of repositories already. There's nothing else to do. And if not successful, then we throw an exception with any message that we want or anything that we want exactly. And that's it. No, this is just three lines of code. And this is all that we need to issue a call to GitHub, just one page, come back, and parse all the results. Isn't that great? That's a time saver. How do we consume this? The trick is in this type, the promise. There is another component in the application called a controller. I like to, uh, to use the MVC pattern when creating desktop applications. So the controller is the one that says, I'm going to consume the promise. So let's see. GitHub is the object that returns the promise. So this is the promise that right there. In this particular version, I will handle intermediate results. All right. And then we're going to uh, register callbacks on the promise. If there are any intermediate results, what I'm going to do is, what is that? A method reference in Java 8. So we're going to add the element directly to our list. All right? If it fails, right now I'm just going to print out to this, uh, the stack trace to the system error. And regardless if it fails or if it's successful, our, we're going to set some state. Remember when I started to type on the application and the, uh, the button, the blue one became enabled? But the moment that I hit on it, the cancel button, the red one, become enabled. That is because we're changing the state. And that is because of that. And when I set the state to ready, the, the cancel button becomes disabled. Now, this is great because if you know promises from other environments, then you can apply it directly right away with Java. It works with JDK 6. You can chain promises from one to another. You can even adapt values from one another. And uh, you can use Lambda expressions, but promises as they are currently implemented are a one-shot execution. You simply say, do this, and when it's finished or fails, do that. What if you wanted or you needed to consume the values as a series of events in a streamable fashion, perhaps? Are there alternatives? Yeah. We jump into reactive programming. And reacting programming is nothing new. For those of you that did Swing, you know this already. This is just basic property chain listener and property chain event. That's all that we're doing with different names and a lot of operations. Rx Java is one of the initial projects that started with the uh, reactive programming in Java. So it's probably the most uh, known project out there. So what we're going to do is a thing, instead of creating a promise, we're going to use an observable. This is Rx Java 1. In Rx Java 2, you will probably go with Flowable, 
What is the difference? Flowable in RxJava 2 is a stream of values that also support a concept called back pressure. And what is back pressure? If the server is too fast in producing content and the client is too slow to consume the content, then the client is going to be bogged down. So what the client says using back pressure to the server is, please stop or slow down or wait up so that I can finish the task that I'm currently doing. And when I'm done, I'm going to consume everything else. And you can tweak this thing around. In RxJava 1, Observable kind of had back pressure, but it wasn't the right thing to do. In RxJava 2, they decided to split the behavior. And if you need back pressure, it is flowable. And if it's just a series of events without back pressure, it's observable. It's as simple as that. So now we got an observable, all right? And then what we do is decorate the observable with different operations. We take, we're going to say, well, the event might produce like a thousand events this stream. But we only want to take as much as that particular value, perhaps 10, perhaps 100. And I said something. We are decorating the observable. Because this observable is not exactly the same observable returned by this, right? So I can still refer to this and do something else. But with this, this operation will be different. And now we continue to do the same thing. And we continue ch to change. So we actually have different observables until we, we reach the end. So what are we saying here? Um, we're going to have a timeout. That's important. Because if the network call takes too long, then we don't want to wait forever. So let's limit a timeout of 10 seconds. Then when we subscribe, that means uh, when we are starting the connection, we're going to change the state. Again, the button. And if it terminates, regardless if I was successful or an error, we're going to change the state again. Nice. We're going to subscribe on a background thread. Otherwise, it will be the same thread as the caller. We don't want to do that. And when we subscribe, there are many ways to handle this. But for each element or this, each event that's coming down the stream, we're going to add it to um, a list. And if there's any errors, we're going to print it out. This is very similar to what we saw before with the promise, how we handle this. But the arrangement is different. So now you may be thinking, this is nice, but that is just plain RxJava. Where is our HTTP client? Is there a way that we can combine RxJava and retrofit? Guess what? Yeah, you can. What are the changes? From this side, they look exactly the same, same parameters. What changes is the return type. This used to be just call. Now, it's observable of response of the type of objects that we want. The next step is to configure the, the retrofit builder to let him be aware that you also want to use RxJava. Just one line of code. Register a new factory. And that's it. Nothing more. So now, you can issue a call, get an observable, and inspect the response and do anything that you need. And given that we want to consume different pages, we have to find a way to uh, combine all these different lists. Because every time that we query for a page, what are we going to get? A list of repository. And then we follow the next page, another list, and another list. But we need to have something that is just one set of events, one set of repositories. We need an observable. So for this, we need to concatenate and flat map all the lists into just a single structure. So here's one way that we, it's, we can do it. This, again, this is just custom code for the application, consuming RxJava. When we call this method, we're gonna ha we have two Lambda expressions, one for the first method call, remember, that takes the organization name, and another that inspects the links object. This is how we will parse the headers and follows using the next URL, so the different method call, right? And that's it. How do we do the concatenation? is thanks to the operations that our XJava exposes, just like this. We call the first page, and there is a next one. It will call this method. And what is this method? This one returns the observable of type T, which is repository, not list of repository, because again, we're flat mapping. So flat map right there, one of the operations that we can call on the uh, operator, on, on the observable. 
And for each response, what we're going to do? Find if it has headers. Find if there is a link header in that thing. Grab all the responses right there. And if it has links, then follow it concatenating. At the end, again, all those different lists get pushed into just a single stream of repository objects. So your consumer becomes very easy, as we saw before. It's just a repository as it keeps streaming out from the source. There are more operations that you can call on, on observables. And just be aware that every operation that you invoke will generate a new observable. I like to showcase our Java because it's the initial one. But if you are keen to using the Spring-based projects, then there is Project Reactor. The API between ArcJava and Project Reactor are very similar. In ArcJava, they call it Flowable. In Reactor, they call it Flux. There is a single stream in ArcJava, a single element stream that is called Single. In Reactor, it's called Mono. That's it. Finally, this is the last thing that we do for production, and then we get into testing, is the component communication. So when I tried to use the application for the first time, you saw that a dialog pop up saying, I, didn't, I, I don't have network. Well, so far, what I have done in the, uh, shown in the code is that if we encounter a problem accessing the client, we print out to the stack trace, right? to, the, uh, to, the, to the console. But it would be better to showcase a dialog or do something else. But the controller should not be aware of what's going on. You simply say something like, hey, I encountered an error. So now I'm going to ship that error somewhere else, and somebody should be able to handle it. How do we do this? Well, we can use an event bus. And even though Guava provides a simple event bus, it's not as highly configurable and flexible as this one. It's called Ambassador. Here is how we publish an event. You will have to create your own custom event. It's a subclass of a very basic event boss uh, class provided by Ambassador. And uh, you can use injection, of course, if you want to. And then the only thing that changes is this line of code. Instead of printing, we instruct the event boss to publish a new event. Remember this class that we saw earlier with Lombok? Here's the example by passing it directly to the constructor, the instance object. And uh, we publish in two ways. We can simply say publish, which is synchronous. That means the, the, the producer, this component, will wait for all the listeners, all the consumers, to be done with the event. That may be sometimes what you need. In our case, we simply say publish asynchronous, which is fire and forget. Here's the event, and the producer continues to do its thing, and the consumers will do whatever they need to do at another point in time in a different thread. And that's it. How do we consume this thing? Like this. We have, again, the reference to the event boss. And we have to register ourselves with the event boss as a consumer. Nice usage of post construct that previous story. Because once this uh, property has been injected, this dependency has been resolved, this method will be called immediately, and then we register ourselves. And when the dependency con injection container says this instant is gone, we don't need it, we unregister ourselves. Always be good citizens. I'm really keen on using symmetric APIs. If there is something to say I register myself, I will expect that API to allow me to unregister myself so that I can use this nice life cycle handling mechanism so that I can do the right thing at the proper time. The last thing to do is this, the handler. The important thing is the annotation and the event type. The name of the method, not important. So when we register ourselves with the event boss, it will, it will look at all the different methods that we have annotated and match the arguments. So when someone ships or sends or publishes an event of that type, this method is going to be handled. Is going to be invoked, and that's it. You can filter I I these events by subtype if you want to, or by other means. But this is the very basic concept. Now, I like that Ambassador is quite fast; it's quite good, and there is a link to uh, performance within other alternatives. But, 
be aware that the author of the project is no longer as active as it was before. So if you encounter a problem, if you encounter a bug, the reply and or the, uh, the fix will not be or will not happen as soon as you may expect. That's how open source works. This being said, we have this in production and we have this with banks and it works pretty good. We haven't found any problems that we cannot fix so far. So it's still good. How are we doing? Good? You guys let me know if you need a rest. Because now that we have finished production code, we get into the interesting bit of testing because we all do testing, right? Yay, no, perhaps, if we have time. That's kind of the problem, if we have time. Uh, but let me tell you that the projects that we're going to see will allow you to have that extra time because we'll reduce the amount of code that you need to write in order to do testing. So let's see some hands. Uh, who uses JUnit 4 for testing? Okay, like 50%. Uh, testing G? There's always one person. Nice. Uh, Spark? Aha, uh -huh. here's an opportunity. Good. So for those that use JUnit 4, uh, have you ever had the need to parameterize a test case? All right, so here's how you do parameterizing of test, test cases. You define a method that takes some arguments, say, for example, three arguments, and there's a string, a string, integer. You parameterize it using the annotations, you're done. Perfect. Now, you have the same setup, and you need a different set of parameterization. Now you need int a string map. Can you do this? No. Here's another method. I just need a map. Can you do this? No, not in the same test case. You have to write a different test case. That's kind of bad because these three methods belong to the same testing unit, if you will. But in order to be able to do this, you can use a project called JUnit params. It's an extension of JUnit that requires a custom runner. It's right there. With this, you can parameterize as many methods in the same test case with different arguments and with different types of arguments. And there are three ways for you to parameterize. One, you define the values right there in the method, like this. This is an empty string, not double quotes, but uh, no, actually, no, no, this is not the empty. This is just, hold on a second. Uh, this is weird. No, yeah, here's the empty string right there. And uh, so we have two values there and two values there. Given the input blank, we expect that value. Given the input test, we expect that value. You can also define the, meth the name of a method that functions as a data provider, or you can also define a class that has a simple, simple method that returns uh, the values. Notice the other thing, the method names, the method now takes arguments of the right type with the right name. So there will be some data transformation if if this thing were to expect integers or some other type. So given that we create our instance, uh, our class under test, in this case is the service, then we expect this thing. That we call that with that input and we expect that, that output. I guess most of you are familiar with this. This is Hamcrest and JUnit4. Okay, we'll see in the, uh, the following up uh, presentation what we can do better to do, wh what we can do better to do uh, here with uh, messages. But this is very simple. Again, the single constraint that you have when using unit params, you need a custom runner. If you're already using a runner for other means, then you cannot use JUnit params with the same test case. That would be a problem. Okay, the next one is uh, when we have a class under test and we have different collaborators, uh, we need to set up some kind of fake collaborators, don't we? Because we only want to test the class on the test. That's the whole point. Uh, what do we do in this case? Do we create new instances on the, on the fly, like anonymous inner classes, or define a custom class in the test case, or something that is shared by other test cases? Yeah. Well, I would say that it's better if we use something like a mocking framework. And of all the different mocking frameworks, Mokito is the one that is leading the pack. And uh, here's how you can tell, you can think of Mokito as a DSL for defining expectations. All of the entry points of Mokito are done via static methods. So let's see, using JUnit params, which is independent of Mokito, by the way, 
uh, here's a class under test in the controller. The model is a plain pojo, so we use it as is. And then we do set service off, and here's the entry point. We mock that interface. Again, the reason why I would prefer to use defined, by, defined contracts by interfaces is that makes the testing much, much easier. All right, here we go. Then we define the expectations. When that mock, which is the one that we set there, we invoke the method with such input, then we expect some output. So far, so good. We invoke the stimuli here, the controller, we internally invoke the service, right? And then we verify that the controller did the right thing. We also verify that the mock, that mock, was invoked once with such method and that input. If this is OK, but this is not, then there is a problem. The controller is lying to us. It found the appropriate result, but with a different mechanism that was not following our expectations. That's why we have this thing here. So with Mokito, you can have three types of objects. You can have stops, which are like this one, when you simply say, given this input, return that output. I don't care what it is. There are mocks, which given this input, you return that output, but you must call that method in certain order and with certain cardinality. If either of these two are wrong, even if you verify this, it will tell you there is a problem because mocks are very strict. And finally, we got spies. The spies are real objects for which when you want to invoke some of the real behavior, some of the production, what's going on? Wrote production code. But some of the methods, you need to fake them out for the purpose of the particular test case that, that you're running. The spies are not so much used in the wild, but they can, be, they can become useful. Because sometimes you don't want to mock a lot of things you know, for something to happen. It's better to use the real deal with just a small tweak. Think of testing exceptions. If someone is obsessed with having 100% coverage, it's very unlikely to happen if you do not test all the branches, especially with exceptions. And if there is a very specific case that you cannot reproduce, then using a real spy with a mock, you can throw a specific exception on a particular code path and boom, you get 100% code coverage back again. Mokito is pretty much a fluid DSL uh, based on static methods. It provides, again, stops, mocks, and spies. It can mock interfaces, abstract classes, concrete classes, and final classes. It's kind of weird. It works. And I don't recommend you to do this. It's mostly because you may be dealing with legacy code that for some reason decided to define a final class that needs to be tested and is a, a collaborator. You can still do this with Mokito. OK. So some of you use JUnit. So you might use Juice. And you may be thinking, oh, I want to use Mokito. So bring three projects together. Mm. What about Yukito? Yukito is pretty much these things three together combined. Yeah, it sounds weird. It's created by, uh, by a French company. And they say, Yukito sounds like uh, martial arts. Yeah, OK. So this thing also has a custom runner. Uh, you run with JUnit 4. Uh, it allows you to do dependency injection on the test case. Look at that. And for any type for which you do not provide a binding, guess what? A mock will be created automatically for you. This is great because if you have kind of like an integration test case where you need to have the same mock used by two different classes, if you were to do this by hand, let me tell you it's going to be troublesome to inject that single mock in two different places. But Yukito does that for you. And here's, for example, here's a method annotated with JUnit uh, add before. When we pass an argument for which there is no binding, so this is a mock. So this is the same kind of expectation that we had before, right? With concrete values. And now the test case looks pretty much the same as before. Here's the model. Uh, we set some values on it. Execute the stimuli. And then the assertions. Uh, wait a second. We didn't have to inject the service in the controller as we did before. We didn't have to do it explicitly. Why? Because the controller is injected by the dependency injection container. And the mock is also available in the container. 
So when we are we invoke the controller right here, this thing has all its dependencies. The real ones, the mock ones, stop and spice. Everything is ready here. So the only thing that we need to do is run it, verify, and verify the mock or stop as well. Much, much easier. Um, so it brings together the three projects, yeah, Unit, Juice, and Mojito under one roof. And uh, there is another way, there is another annotation that you could use here. I think that is called at all. So you have multiple bindings of the same value. You can parameterize this test case. So say that you have had three different bindings, then I have three different invocations of the same test case. Why? Because given that we're using a custom runner, we cannot parameterize this test case using JUnit params because it requires another custom runner. So that's an advantage. Okay. Some of you said that you have used Groovy in the past, uh, but none of you said that you're using a Spark. So if you feel feeling adventurous, I highly recommend you to have a look at this. A Spark is a Groovy DSL for creating tests. So all the behavior that we saw before, parameterization and uh, mocking, and plus a few other features are brought by just Spark. And a Spark is JUnit compatible. So if you have a specific JUnit extension that you want to run or use, then you can use it with a Spark. So let's see what's going on here. First, we have to write Groovy code. But uh, Groovy code is very easy or very similar to Java. Uh, you had Guillaume for a few months ago. I think that he, he gave a talk on Groovy. So here's how you do things with Groovy. You currently have your Java code, right? Stick it as it is, rename the file to .groovy, pass it to the Groovy compiler. 98% of the times, the code is going to work and compile. Because Groovy is pretty much a superset of the uh, Java syntax. There are a few changes, especially in Java 8, we are still not already 100% compatible. But if you're still in JDK 7, then it's going to work. So you came here looking for Java libraries you cannot afford to miss, and a few other projects and testing. But you will leave this talk knowing another programming language. You can use Groovy right away. Just rename your files. It's as easy as that. Then we remove a lot of noise. For example, no semicolons, uh, property access, and a few other things. Now, let's see. What is this? This is the um, placeholder or the dynamic type definition. It's the same thing as object. In Spark, you can use void or def. It doesn't matter. But what is that? Is that a method name? Uh, Maybe because it has the uh, parentheses embrace, but what is that? It's a string, isn't it? Weird. And it has the spaces and this character. What's going on here? Well, let me tell you that Java, the JVM language, uh, sorry, the, the JVM, allows you to use any kind of characters as an identifier, just like spaces. But it's Java the language, the one that says, no, I'm going to restrict the set of characters to just this, which excludes spaces. And this character, how do you call this character? Octosharp, hash, right? It has different names. Anyway, so what's going on here is that this test method is already parameterized. And these are placeholders for the values. And because this is a string, then I can be as expressive as I want. If, we, if I really want to, then because Groovy has multi-line string support, I can write a whole paragraph right there. I can be very creative with the content, not just following this uh, camel case convention with something that looks quite weird and is not really parameterizable. All right. Now, you saw before in the other test cases that I was using comments for these blocks, given when, then, something like this. And I was just getting you ready for a Spark, because these blocks have a special meaning. To you, as a regular Java developer, they may look just like regular labels or code blocks, right? But for a Spark, this means in this block, I'm going to initialize some values. This is how I'm going to set up my test case. Given and set up are aliases. The next one is the stimuli block. 
This is where we expect the real deal to happen. And then come the assertions. I said assertions, but what is that? A value using property access, controller, get model, get output. That's actually what the, con the compiler will see, getters. This is not field access. And this is probably a string. That is a string. What is that? An equals operator. Is that how we compare strings? No, but we wish we could, right? Well, Groovy has operator overloading. So this operator actually invokes the equals method for us. So it does the right thing. Perfect. So this equals that. Where is the assertion? It is an implicit assertion because it happens inside the dem block. It is assumed by Spock that all the operations that are following this block can be evaluated into a Boolean context using what is known as the Groovy truth, which means if this evaluates to a Boolean truth, perfect. If this evaluates to a collection, and if it's empty, it's going to be false. If this is a pattern matching operation and returns no matches, it's going to be false. If there is at least one match, it's going to be truth. And we follow how the rules of the Groovy truth so that makes our assertions much more concise. And the last thing that we've seen here is one of the ways that we can parameterize our test case. Output and input, those things are defined here. This operator is the left sheet operator. It's pretty much calling add on something, these somethings. And this is a collection literal that we wish we had collection literals in Java. Coming up in Java 9, using uh, factory methods. List of, math of, set of, direct syntax. So this is a list with two uh, strings, and here's another list with two strings. So the first value of input will be empty, and the first value of output will be how do strange. Second value, second value, execute, done. The final thing that I didn't show is that that's how we create a mock, pass the value, and then using a closure or a blind expression, if you will, we specify that in this method with that value, then we'll generate certain output. And we can add as many as we want, which will going to be invoked in that order. And because we define just once, this is just one invocation. So if we invoke this, 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 um, this mock more than once, and we have a special verification, it will let us know that it will fail. So it's basically a Groovy DSL for doing testing. It's JUnit friendly. You can parameterize, you can mock, you can do all the crazy and magical things that Groovy allows you to do. I have seen many teams following the standard Java conventions for the production code, but choosing a Spark instead of JUnit for the testing purposes. Uh, we're almost done with this. Um, we know that we're dealing with concurrency, right? And uh, how do we usually test concurrent code? So for example, we know that something has to be run on the background, and we have to wait for that process to finish so we can continue. What's the natural thing to do? We use a thread.slip, right? And then we simply say, eh, that's like two seconds is fine. What if the operation takes more than that? Eh, fails. What if it takes less than that? Well, I still waited two seconds because that's the limit, right? Would it be better if there were a conditional wait, a, co a conditional wait that we can wait, right? As much as, but no more. So that's precisely what our utility allows us to do. With our utility, and we know for a fact that the controller is going to run on a background thread, and uh, so we do the setup as we know. Okay, perfect. This time it's using observables. That's fine. All right. So we know this thing will run on the background. Perfect. We load, so this invokes the observable in the background. And then here's the entry point. We await up to two seconds, but it could be less. For this condition, we're using a method reference, but it could be a lambda, to be equal to some value using hand crest matchers. So once with this happens, if it's before two seconds, the test case will continue. If we take two seconds or more, the test case fails. It's too slow. And if it continues, when do do the right verification, assertions, and whatnot, if we had any mocks like that. And that's it. 
So the advantage of iWaitility is that it has a conditional wait instruction. This is pretty much a DSL again. It has extensions for Java 8, to, so that I can use lambdas. Uh, for Groovy, so you can use closures. And for Scala, if you want to use functions, Scala functions. And all the conditions are customizable using handcraft masters. Finally, and here I'm going to run the test for real. And uh, I'm going to disable network. So no cheating. And uh, let's do the tests. And one of the test cases is a functional test case that uh, will fake out the GitHub API somehow. Because again, no network. Because it will be kind of silly. Look, no hands. It will be kind of silly that our test case will hit the real GitHub server every time, isn't it? It will also be difficult for us to have a external server on which we have the right setup for a particular test case before we run the test case. What if there are concurrent test cases trying to access the same server? That's kind of a problem. It's better if we can pull in that server into the test case. We know that if you use Maven or Gradle, you can bootstrap a server as part of the test. But you still have the problem of a, perhaps a shared test server within different test cases. It will be better if we are able to have a single fake server per test case. And that is exactly what Wiremark allows us to do. A Wiremark can be run using a JUnit rule. If you haven't seen rules, they are pretty much uh, like test case decorators. Apply behavior before and after a test method or before and after a, a whole test case. The way that I have set up Wiremark, if you see in the code, it's a simple test rule, so a method rule, so before and after the test method. So once we have the fake server running, we're going to stop for a particular get URL. And if that get URL matches, then we're going to reply with a status response of 200, so everything is good, with some headers, perfect, and some content. Uh, match up as JSON. This is actually making use of Jackson again to marshal from Java to JSON in this case. And if we found that other URL, then we respond to something. The, actually, the code, if we see it, I think there is an example where, uh, let me be, go this way, there is an example where the test case we make an error. Let's see it in this, this functional test case here. Um, so there's the, the rule right there. This is the, the fake server listening on, on port 8080. And then here's the happy path. We always test the happy path where we match that particular URL. And if that's the case, then just reply. This is exactly the same as, the, um, as in the slides. Then we click. This is using another project called TestFX. It's only usable for JavaFX UIs. This is the one that's uh, displaying the UI. And what happens if we cancel? We can reply with fixed delay. So we're going to wait 200 milliseconds. And we reply with this and say something else. But you can also, I don't know if we have the error path here. Yeah, failure path. We reply with a status 500 and such error. And then we verify that the, uh, the dialog that says the alert wa uh, was shown in this case. So now we have a fully functional, functional test case that is completely independent from the real server. And we can play around with all the settings required in order for this test case to work. How about that? OK. Um, this pretty much finishes this part of the presentation. And we can follow up with test cases. Um, so before I finish this, I would like to show you this. I have started a newsletter when I, on, on which I talk about these things. And uh, I think that I'm about, uh, issue number three is about to be published. And the second link is the same newsletter, but in Spanish. So if you got any Spanish speaking friends, please let them know about the second link as well. And uh, I would I like to discuss all the topics that we saw today and a few others on, on this short blog post and presentation. So please subscribe. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. If you want to take a break, then we take a break. Or should we continue with the next presentation? Given that 
half of the present the next presentation we have already seen it will be quite fast like 30 minutes or so so what do you guys want to do take a break all right so 10 minutes and we resume at 10 at 9 all right perfect works for me <laughs>